All right, thanks, Nancy. Very happy to be able to speak today. Uh, basically, the answer to this question is not very much. And just a couple of disclaimers. I'm not presenting any data, original data today. I'm not currently doing any work in the area of PPCPs. So I've followed this issue uh, to some degree. Although Teresa and I are dabbling a little bit in the soy isoflavones, which are being used as nutraceuticals to some extent. So, in, and I'm, here I'm defining wildlife broadly as wild vertebrates. Um, so what are some possible routes of exposure for wildlife to PPCPs? Uh, one that we're, you know, we've heard a lot about today are through the uh, sewage, sewage effluent. Um, also through the uh, application of manure or biosolids and runoff from uh, you know, livestock operations, also perhaps percolation through the soil into the shallow groundwater. And I'd never seen anything like this until I was looking on Google for some uh, pictures of a manure spreader. i just never, never seen a, a large manure spreader like that. Um, also through landfill disposal and again probably perhaps through surface runoff and uh, contamination of shallow groundwater. Uh, when we think of relay toxicosis or secondary poisoning, we usually think of uh, poisons that are meant to kill something, but we'll, we'll talk uh, briefly later on in the talk here about uh, a novel um, incident that occurred um, with a, a veterinary pharmaceutical. And also at least with at least one, one class of compounds, uh, volatilization can be, uh, might be an issue. Okay, so. I'm going to start kind of broadly and then I'll, I'll narrow down and become more focused as we go on, but um, one of the most dramatic effects of exposure to sewage effluent has been hermaphrodism. And this has, you know, hit the papers and the media um, in the last several years. It was the first observed in roach, and in this kind of roach, which is a fish. Uh, common to UK and some other parts of Europe. Uh, back in the 1980s, and a couple of people went and looked at it and said, yeah, there's something going on, and not much more was done until the 1990s on this issue. And just about everywhere that someone's looked, and in every species of fish that they looked at, downstream of sewage effluent, um, they found hermaphrodism or intersex in fish. And this has ranged from zero to 100 percent. It's often around 15 to 35 percent, and of course that varies depending on things like you know how much does the effluent contribute to the, the flow of the receiving stream? What are the uh, uh, technologies that the sewage treatment plant is using, and and so on and so forth? But again, generally it's been around a fifth to a third of the male fish have been found to actually be intersex. And just to give you an idea of what uh, that looks like, here's the gonad of a male fish, and this is the testicular tissue, and there are some primary oocytes found in the, in the testis of this fish. And this can range from just one or a few um, to many, many. This is an, another um, intersex individual in which there's actually testis and an ovary in that individual. So you can see this is defined here, they're diffused throughout the testicular tissue. And here this is the secondary oocytes where the, the ova are actually maturing in this individual. And there have been other effects that have been documented in fish downstream of sewage effluent, uh, sewage treatment plants. Vitellogenin induction is kind of the gold standard. Vitellogenin is an a egg precursor a protein that's generally you can't measure it or detect it in males. And it, obviously females produce this as they're beginning to, eggs are beginning to develop. 
abnormal spermatogenesis, diminished secondary sexual characters. That would be something like, you know, a lot of male fish, when they come into breeding condition, they have bright coloration. Sometimes their fins are elongated. They grow these little tubercles or bumps on their head. Let's go back. And so those might be diminished in an intersex individual. And there have been, there are some effects that can occur in female fish. Things like, you know, extended period of intelligent production, which is supposed to just happen at certain times of the year, delayed oocyte maturation, and atretic follicles, which is basically the ova uh, degenerated in the ovary and it wasn't released like should normally happen. Well, what's the big deal? So there's some intersex individuals. Can they reproduce? And the answer is kind of, the answer is, well, maybe. It depends. Uh, many of these have fewer or less modal sperm, as well as some behavior or morphological changes that confer disadvantage. So yes, in more severely impacted individuals, uh, they're not able to reproduce effectively. Well, again, you know, so what? What's the big deal? There are some males, in most of these places, there are some males that are, uh, you know, completely male that aren't intersex. Are there population level impacts? Now, ethanol, 17 beta ethanol estradiol, which is synthetic estrogen used in birth control pills and also some therapeutic uh, uses is by and large the most potent endocrine disruptor that's found in sewage effluent. Uh, lower reserve affects concentrations down to uh, subparts per trillion levels. And generally, again, I said this is the most potent endocrine disruptor being found in sewage effluent. Um, in some cases, some of the other compounds like the alkaphenolic uh, alka compounds may contribute a substantial amount to estrogenicity. You might have a, a, some sort of industry that is um, using these compounds and they're getting into the, the sewage treatment system. Well, recently, and I think that this was just published this last summer, Kid et al. dosed a 34 hectare lake with 17 beta ethanol estradiol for three years. And it measured the concentrations at periodically, and these were the average for the three years. And these are about what we might expect in um, treated effluent. And they examined population of fathead minnow for seven years, two years prior to, three years during treatment, and two years after treatment. And they found all these effects that I mentioned previously, and the population crashed. It's based on uh, catch per unit effort. They're trapping these, these fish. Declined from 180 to essentially nothing uh, two years after the experiment. And so I think they've demonstrated there can be broader population level impacts. You see here there was 44% of the males were intersex. So, um, you know, the problem is they weren't getting, there wasn't recruitment into the population and after successive years of this, you know, the population, the individuals died and the population couldn't sustain itself. Now I have this Pearl dace is another type of fish. It's more long lived than uh, fathead minnow. To remind myself that this isn't the end of the story because you have to go to another publication and where they looked at pearl dace and although they found these same effects, the population didn't crash. It did decline somewhat, but they didn't see the dramatic uh, decline in population that they did in the fathead minnows. And you know, this shows that we have to be careful about using one species 
and extrapolating to a bunch of other species. So. Now there's been a lot of hoopla about the uh, estrogenic effects of sewage effluent. And you can go out in the literature, in the scientific literature and in gray literature and find you know, all kinds of studies where people ran out in the 1990s and, and up to the present and caught a bunch of fish below sewage treatment plants, sectioned their tissues and found intersex individuals. And the idea of toxic effects kind of, you know, wasn't really, uh, didn't really drift to the surface. However, Linnea et al. Uh, exposed juvenile roach to effluents, various uh, concentrations, and they found that levels that produced intersex also affected kidney develop, immune function, and gen genotoxic damage. So lo and behold, there were these other toxic effects occurring, even at concentrations below those where they were able to see, to find uh, reproductive effects. Now I'd like to change gears a little bit and talk about serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And most of you probably know that these are prescribed for people with depression or anxiety disorders. And they inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. It's thought that people that are depressed aren't producing enough serotonin. Serotonin is found in all, bio, all animals and even in some plants. And um, what happens is it, it the serotonin can't be taken up again from the postsynaptic gap, and so it's kind of the um, it's repeatedly stimulating the the postsynaptic receptors, and you feel good all the time. So, at least that's the idea. We're using just you know extremely large amounts of this stuff. There were over 33 million prescriptions for Prozac alone in the United States in 2002, and other developed nations are probably using similar uh, amounts of antidepressants. And fluoxetine, which is the, the compound which goes under the trade name of Prozac, has been detected in eff effluents um, in several studies. And I'm not sure why Kalpan et al. were only able to detect this in one stream. This is surprising to me. And uh, not only because we're using a lot of this stuff, but Metcalf et al. found it in, I believe, three or four of the streams that they examine. Um, but anyway, it is out there in the environment. And Brooks et al. were able to detect fluoxetine and also sertraline, which is uh, Zoloft or Lustral, and a metabolite of each in the tissues of fish in a municipal effluent dominated stream. And this is kind of scary to me because you know now we have another mode of exposure we have potential transfer from the aquatic to the terrestrial ecosystem in whatever it might eat the fish, including humans. So I think this is another, you know, another uh, potential exposure of humans that we need to consider. It like, might not just be drinking our drinking water. Marcia Black uh, from University of Georgia, who some of you might have met, uh, she spent, I believe, a year here on sabbatical um, just, just recently. Um, her and her colleagues examined the effects of fluoxetine on fish and amphibians. In mosquito fish, they did find behavioral changes down to 0.6 parts per billion and delayed development, increased time to metamorphosis in Xenopus, which is the African clawed frog, which is like the lab rat of uh, amphibians, at 30 parts per billion. However you see that is, those are above, well above levels in the environment that have been detected in the environment. However, they also, observe reduced mass and limb malformations at their lowest treatment level, which were at environmentally relevant concentrations. However, they did not observe these effects in the gray tree frog, which is a, a native species which is found in Illinois. 
so again, we get into that species specific issue and, and not generalizing, I think, um, especially cross broad, you know, taxonomic um, got, um, divisions. The xenopus aren't you know, even closely related to gray tree frogs. Now we've heard a little bit today uh, previously about triclosan, and actually I think that's the third pronunciation I've heard of it. So I don't, know, I don't know what the official industry uh, pronunciation is. And as we heard, it's, it's being you know, very widely used these days in antibacterial, in uh, uh, personal care products, toothpaste and soaps and so on and so forth, food handling, surfaces, clothing, surgical supplies, um, so on and so forth. And this was, this has been broadly, de you know, detected in the environment. Um, you know, the infamous or famous Culpin et al. study detected in 55% of the streams. I'm not sure where, what, where I got this reference, but. Um, much, much higher in sewage sludge. So we're out there, we're, we're spreading this stuff on fields and, and other places, and uh, these compounds are, are at high, can be at high concentrations in this, uh, in biosolids and manure and things. So it's Triclosan has been detected in human breast milk, fish, and shellfish. And it's of concern because it has similar structure to thyroid hormones and also to non-steroidal estrogens. There's been some suggestion that it may be weakly androgenic. There's been a few studies which have detected overt toxic effects, but they've been primarily at you know, very high concentrations that haven't been detected in the environment. However, Veldhain, Veldhain, Veldhain et al. examined subtle effects of metamorphosis. And metamorphosis is this you know, exquisitely complex, orchestrated uh, process that's being driven by thyroid hormones. And what we're finding is that some of these things that have endocrine disrupting effects can influence metamorphosis you know, at these minute, minute concentrations. And actually, if you could correct this in your uh, paper, uh, I think it's, it's 15 micrograms per liter in your, in your handout, but it should be 0.15. What you see is you know, well within uh, what's been found out in the, in the field. And they, um, in this study, they found that, at a, again, at environmentally relevant concentrations, that triclosan disrupted hormone-associated gene expression and altered the rate of, thor of thyroid hormone-mediated neuron development. So it had some dramatic effects on uh, metamorphosis. And if you're delaying metamorphosis, I mean, it's very critical to many species of frogs. You know, when the rains come in the spring and there's these puddles, they, they need to get out there, lay eggs, the eggs need to develop, and the young need to develop legs and be able to um, get out of these shallow wetlands before they dry up. It's again very, very critical to the natural history of most amphibians. Synthetic musks. Um, <coughs> synthetic musks are volatile, and they've been detected over large cities, and so they represent another mode of potential mode of transfer to wildlife. Um, let's see, I'm maybe running out of time here, but uh, two minute warning. Or no <laughs> well, everybody else went over. Um, there's very little known about the possible health effects. They do seem to accumulate in biota. Um, they've been found in, even at, in marine mammals in Florida and off the coasts of US and Japan and other places, not in polar bears, by the way. Um, 
and its importance to human environmental health is controversial. So I think there's a lot more work that needs to, done, needs to be done with regard to synthetic musks. I'll keep moving along here. Now we've been talking mostly about uh, you know, pharmaceuticals and personal care products from the standpoint of you know, in our water, in our waste stream. But also there was a, there's been an a incident, well I say an incident, but there have been dramatic declines in three species of vulture in Southeast Asia. And best estimate is this is in the millions of birds over about a 10 or 15 year period to where several species become critically endangered. Necropsies of some birds revealed an acute gout, that's a buildup of uric acid crystals and indicates there's some problems with kidney function. They suspected diseases and pesticides, did a whole litany of tests, all were negative in the birds that had the acute gout. And as in this case with a lot of these things, a light bulb went on in somebody's head and they tested them for this uh, diclofenac, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that is, also, is used in humans, has been for a long time, but also in livestock. To, it's a very treat, cheap, effective treatment for inflammation, pain, and fever used throughout Southeast Asia. And what happens is people give this to their cow, they get the last few clicks out of it, and the animal's left to die. It's skin because the hide is worth something. But in a lot of the cultures, uh, secular cultures, they're uh, not to be eaten or do anything with the carcass. They're left to lie there and vultures feed on them. And so in animals that were recently treated with diclofenac and then died very quickly, vultures were getting enough of a dose of diclofenac to poison them. And this was occurring you know, throughout Southeast Asia, still is. It has been banned in for general veterinary use in India and Nepal. There is a self safer alternative that, uh, in fact, some bird interest groups are exchanging um, with veterinary pharmacies for the diclofenac. And in borrowing a, a, a law from physics, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Decline in vultures resulted in this you know, boom in the population of feral dogs. And so that resulted in more attacks on humans, in rabies epidemics, and so on and so forth. So um, some other impacts. And I'll just close with that and we can discuss some possible research needs this afternoon in the in the discussion.